Welcome to episode three of Electrifying AI, a podcast series focused on the electric power industry. My name is Simon Hughes from SAS, and I will be your host today. And as in our previous episodes, I'm joined by our resident industry expert, Sal Gill. And hello, Sal. Greetings from the UK. Hey, Simon. And yes, it's still me. I was going to say, Sal, a, a, a bit of a change of appearance there. So I know you've just moved to Phoenix, Arizona. Were you getting too hot and that's why you've lost the beard? I, I think so, yes. I, I just can't handle the heat anymore. So something had to go. And I thought, let's Indeed, start Indeed, and with not just the, the beard, too. You're looking very, <laughs> uh, looking rather suave, sir, like you've, you've had a bit of a pruning. Yes, absolutely. So I got a, I got a nice haircut. Uh, it was, uh, it was an in-home haircut through my wonderful life. And uh, I, I think it came out pretty good. Yeah, talented lady, no question. I know she's not a hairdresser by trade, so she's done well there. She really has. Yep, yep. <laughs> I'm, I've had one Corona haircut, and I'm, I'm due for another. But uh, I'm, I'm less long head than I used to be. So, uh, anyway, our, our appearances are improving, perhaps a little. Um, so, in this podcast series, Sal and I aim to keep things pretty brief and informal, and only loosely scripted as we explore a range of issues pertaining to the electric power industry. And hopefully you'll see and hear some informed commentary, not for me, of course, because I am the I'm the resident industry novice. It's Sal that we employ for for that commentary. And so this is our third episode. And today we're going to cover Saving Our Planet is the title, uh, which is a huge grandiose sort of title. But really what we're trying to talk about is is how the industry is changing and responding to concerns about climate and the environment. And so in the usual way this works, Sal sends me a whole bunch of stuff which I try and read and ingest and then we talk about it and then we then we we create the show off the back of this. And so Sal, you send me a bunch of materials this time. And one of the and so just working through some of these, then one of the articles describes um the relative cost of different power sources and, and how the cost of renewables is sort of falling and becoming comparative to to conventional sources. And I know we've had a, a chart that we've used in one of our previous episodes, the, the famous duck curve. So I think for our viewers, we will we'll make sure that we splash up this chart on screen as we talk through it. But my reaction as a, as a novice to it was, gosh, haven't, haven't these things sort of started to, to come together and be sort of comparable? Um, but Sal, talk to us about what does it mean and, and, and what, what is the data trying to tell us here? Right. So let me put things in context here from the U.S. environment for starters. You know, we're, we're heading into the election season or we're already in, but November is really right around the corner now. And you know, there's a lot of interesting discussions happening around, you know, what the future of renewables may look like in either administration that that is running for office right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, with with that sort of a context, I will say that frankly, it it sort of really doesn't matter right now uh, when if we look at it from the cost perspective. So our industry uses something called uh, a term called LCOE. It's a measure called levelized cost of energy. And to keep things really simple, all it means is dividing the, the total cost of a, a, a technology over its lifetime by the amount of energy that that technology may produce. So these, these are generation right. technologies. It could right. be solar, it could be wind, it could be a conventional generation asset like a, a gas-fired peaking power plant. Got you. So you, you can compare you know, big, massive installations mm -hmm. with, say, a couple of panels and, a, and a two turbines or something. So it's a common basis for comparison. Basically, right. So you can do like an apples to apples judgment of, sure, of where sure. things are. So if you know, we're going to we're going to throw this chart up, it's it's by yes. Lazard, um, uh, who's, who's a company that's been doing phenomenal work in, in this area in terms of, you know, keeping us up to date on what is happening um, with the costs. Mm -hmm. So Two, 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 two or three things I'd like to point out to the audience. If you look at under the renewable energy bucket, which is the blue um, bucket on top, you'll see solar PV, thin film, utility scale. You'll see wind. Um, and just look at the range of those numbers. You know, For the solar PV one, it's between $32 and $42 per megawatt hour. Wind is between yeah. um, $28 and $54 per megawatt hour. Yeah. And then if you sort of you know, um, bring your eyes down to the conventional side. Yes, because you've got to do this vertically, haven't yeah, you? You've got to yeah. read off the bottom axis. Yeah, yeah. so if you look at uh, the first one on that list, which is gas peaking under conventional, you will see that the cost is between 150 and $199 per megawatt hour, right? Yes. Um, and, you know, you can you can go down the list. You can see where nuclear is, where, where coal is. The point here, folks, is that um, these cost or these levelized costs of energy that we're you know we're displaying here they're without yeah. any government subsidies right so 
Uh, these yes, are, I saw that in the chart title, unsubsidized, which which presumably was a, a distorting effect depending on on where where these things are, and it's it's not even in this chart at all. It's all gone, been yeah, taken out. Yeah, and um, all those you know all those sort of mm. um, sugary things have been have been taken out. So what what this shows is that you know these things are able to stand on their own feet now, and and that's a yes. that's a major. Uh, you know that's a major impact that this is going to have in our in our space, and it already is. Got you. And you've talked before in in, in episodes one and two about how how the the, the cost of, of renewables and, and panels and turbines was was falling. And here we have, you know, documented proof. I mean, I know these are ranges, um, you know, the low and a high. But even so, all of the all of the renewables overlap comfortably overlap the the conventional power ranges are anyway so mm -hmm. so they're very comparable all of a sudden and uh, um and this is a relatively new effect sal you were hinting that perhaps this had been the case for a while but we're only perhaps only just starting to see the data sort of prove it out yeah i i think over the so it's it's not entirely new um it's getting more competitive um to the right. to the scale that you know these things are now able to stand on their own feet so over the course of last i would say five six years uh, we've been noticing this trend where right. the, the cost of these technologies is getting at par or, or you know, even less than now uh, what the conventional assets used to be. Um, so it's, it's been happening. It's just the effects are getting more and more defined now uh, than, than they Got used you. to be. Fascinating stuff and, and very interesting to see, I must say. So a lot of good information on that chart. So hopefully people will, will get a kick out of sort of spending a little bit of time looking through it. There's a lot of notes at the bottom. I guess it's a, a set of sort of complex calculations and caveats going on. But nonetheless, an interesting set of comparisons and so just just moving beyond that then sal we also i also saw from you um how the investment community is reacting to to the sort of the new opportunity represented by by renewables and um attracted by the returns i'm sure and i hopefully you, you'll you'll touch on that a little bit but i noticed that the what seemed to be important was the sort of um uh, the non uh, financial credentials, uh, something that you called environmental, social, and corporate governance, um, it is sort of shaping how investors uh, judge um, the the companies that they're backing. Uh, what, what's happening with investors and, and some big pretty big heavyweights getting involved as well? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me start with BlackRock, right? So I don't need to define or share with people what BlackRock is. I think almost everybody know knows what don't. BlackRock is. So <laughs> I think um, we all know who they when, are. They're huge. When when a when you know when um when in when a company like that goes ahead and makes commitments, right? That one speaks volumes. But then it also happens to be the largest shareholder in RWE, which is a major German uh, firm in this German, space. Yes. And then um SSE or Scottish and Southern Electric in, in the UK and and um, UK and, and Ireland. <laughs> yes. So uh, you know, and, and these are both uh, utilities that are you know also making heavy heavy investments in, um, in in renewable technologies. So I think that shows a lot of strength behind these uh, you know behind these technologies. Sure. And both of those companies presumably were were steeped in conventional generation previously and mm -hmm, their, mm -hmm. their major backers are now saying guys you've got to get into renewables that's where it's that's where it's heading right and i would add to that um, another wow. another really interesting company from europe orsted uh, which formerly was a uh, oil and gas player basically and you know they they were you were on huge on the offshore uh oil, oil and gas type um uh, uh installations you know, they, they platforms, weren't they? Basically, platforms, making platforms right. and rigs, I think, weren't they? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And you know, they they sort of took that as an opportunity, and or they identified this offshore wind as a growing space, and they said, you know, right. well, they have they have the 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 knowledge or the the knowledge capital basically in house already. They just need to apply it to offshore wind turbines. And lo and behold, yeah, yeah. they become the largest, you know, one of the largest uh, offshore wind players in, in very little time. And it's, it's, it's a remarkable yeah. story. And I encourage um, uh, listeners to, to check that, you know, check that company out and what they've been up to. Um, sure. Coming to, to your, um, you know, your, your area, Simon, now in, in Europe. Uh, there is an other really, really interesting uh, group of investors. It's called the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, or IIGCC. Um, yeah. and, and this is a European group of global pension funds and, and investment managers. They total over yeah. 1,200 members in 16 countries and control more than $40 trillion in assets. That's 33 million euros. They may. 
And That's these enormous. guys have drawn up a plan to basically achieve net zero um, uh, uh, or have uh, cut carbon in their portfolios uh, to net zero. Uh, I mean, when, when we look at major, major institutional players like these making these moves, uh, I think it just goes to show the, the future that, you know, that we're looking at uh, for, for renewables. Indeed. And, and so you've got uh, falling prices and increasing competitive uh, parity, if you will, mm -hmm. between the cost of, of these things and the, and the revenues they, uh, they bring in. And you've got these huge investment groups swinging behind um, renewals, renewables. And it does seem to me that that's accelerating adoption. And, and so a number of the things you've also sent me this week or this last few days does really speak to that whole sort of uh, adoption piece and how it is ramping. I guess we've hinted at this in sort of a couple of previous episodes, but we thought we'd major on it in here, given the uh, the focus of this episode. Um, so the first one of these examples, uh, Sal, is this uh, is what's going on in the state of New York. Some, some really big, ambitious goals that they've set um, I mean, we've we've heard from you know statements made by the likes of Microsoft and Volvo and, and Delta and Uber, um, but now we've got the state of New York ma making these big declarations and big ambitious goals about what they want to achieve in the future when it comes to renewables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so New York is one of my favorite. Like, th they are the poster child. So if I were to pick like my favorite list of geographical places around the uh, around right. planet Earth. Uh, New, <laughs> New York would be like the top one um, that I would cool. I would identify. Um, I didn't know that. So one one of the reasons uh, New York has sort of become so strong in this is they had very strong legislation to back these efforts. So they they passed an act. It right. was the community um, uh, the the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, and okay. through that they have said that by uh, they want to achieve. Um, uh, uh, a, a renewable portfolio of of seventy percent. So seventy percent of renewable energy is to be provided by twenty thirty in New York, and a hundred percent of renewable energy is to be provided by uh, twenty forty or clean energy uh, mandate, as is, is what yeah. they call it. So it's um, that's a lot. It's it's a huge play that New York is in right now when it comes to decarbonization of of, of the state. And again, New York also happens to be the you know one of the financial hubs in the world, and um, that sort of well, ties yeah, in. It's a massive city, yeah, and a ma yeah. it's a massive, massive populated conurbation, and they want to in ten years' time be seventy percent dependent on renewables. That's yeah, that's yep. that's ambitious, huh? And and these guys are you know. Um, People may not think of it as you know we we used to we tend to think of New York City as uh, you know this uh, uh, metropolitan dense area New York City in particular Manhattan then is the other one um, so New York also happens to have these you know really interesting and, and nice reserves uh, of of offshore wind energy uh, it's it's interesting yes. you know we we talk about wind reserves now in a, in a Coming, you know, from an environment where the world always used to talk about oil reserves or you know fossil fuel reserves, uh, so right. we're using those same terms in our in our sector too now. But and applying them to applying them to renewable technologies. <laughs> to, so I, I thought that was just and and interesting yes. to uh, in, interesting to share. But New York is also um, the place right now in 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 North America for offshore wind. Uh, I mean, they're making. Really? Uh, Substantial commitments. They're bringing on, you know, really, really large offshore wind projects, um, you know, out a couple hundred miles into the ocean, uh, that that are going to be powering uh, New York State for with, with electricity. So, really, really, um, you know, exciting uh, developments coming out from that state. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, yeah, fast, fascinating to see. Fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the other material you sent me was was really about solar, and uh, we, we've we've talked before about the solar advancement and, and photovoltaic sort of uptake. Um, this time, though, accompanied by a lot of statistics, um, particularly for for last year, and you know sh shipments. And you'll need, perhaps you'll need to explain to us what what that mm -hmm. actually means. But shipments up, and 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 the, and the amount of power generation that it represents is 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 some pretty enormous numbers coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of my I, uh, one of the stats that I shared with you uh, was from the US EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration. And, you know, they're a very credible source when it comes to statistics in the energy sector. Um, right. So when we when we talk about solar PV shipments or, um, you know, installations, basically, uh, what we're looking at is 
Well, let's let's talk about shipments first. Uh, we'll talk about installments uh, second, or installations right. second. When it when it comes to shipments, this is you can think of it as you know the the production and sale or import and export of solar panels in the United States, yeah. and then yeah. the the domestic production of of solar PVs as well. Now in 2019, they had a record breaking year. These stats just came in. And right. uh, what 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 the numbers are basically, they show that 16.4 million kilowatts of um, solar panels were um, uh, or shipments of solar panels were reached in 2019. Right. That is up um, 2.9 million kilowatts from 2016 when the previous record was hit, um, and that, that was in 2016. Um, so, I mean, again, this is. Uh, you know, this is again an other indicator of where yeah, things are going. Yeah. In this case, it's with solar. Uh, I can argue, you know, uh, with with some other statistics that you know it's the same sort of thing that's that's happening on on the on, on the wind side of the house as well. Now, yeah. So that's the that's the um, the shipment part, right? That that tells us something about you know what the economy is in this space like. But let's look at right. this installation or or consumption side of you know how how solar or renewables in general are being are being utilized. So yes. uh, I, I have another, you know, really, really interesting statistic from USEIA. And here they share that um, for the for, for the period this year from January to June um, 2020, right? So we're talking 2020 yeah. here. Um, solar generated electricity expanded by 22% compared to 2019, right? Wow. And then... Um, Overall, the combined net electrical generation by both wind and solar uh, was 16.4% greater than a year ago, right? And and this is in an environment where we're in COVID, right? And yeah. you, know, you can imagine yeah. all sorts of different complexities that are that 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 has brought. Uh, we talked about that last time, didn't we? Right. Yes. And and sort of you know going back to my initial point about you know yeah. Elections are happening and all these things are happening, but you know, sort of, this train has left the station a long time ago, and it's you know, mm. it's it's really picking up its pace and it's it's moving very very fast. Well, um, I had no idea that renewables accounted for that proportion. I, I assumed it was uh, it was, but it's yeah, we, it's approaching a quarter oh, yeah. of all power generated in the USA is is through the renewables, the renewable sources, which is. Uh, well, that's 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 a huge sort of and, and, leap forward, it seems to me, and and that's just the first six months of data, right, Simon? So, uh, well, yeah, and who, who knows where it could land by the end of the year? And of course, we're all, it's a different pattern of life and a different pattern of consumption and generation we're seeing. But nonetheless, it's uh, that that speaks to a, a real change in, in 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 the way it's where it's going. Um, some of the other statistics, some of the other things you you shared with me, um, w- talk to where. So, so, just lingering on solar for a moment, where in the states? Some of these things were taking place, and and I must confess, you know, I'm I'm from the UK, so what do I know? Um, but there were some surprises for me in 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 quite where the these things were taking off. Um, so talk us through some of the things that uh, I mean, we don't necessarily need to share the charts with 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 people, but we can certainly talk about you know what what who who was in the top ten um, for solar take up um, in terms of the states in the US. That's uh, you know. Really, really interesting. Some very interesting observations that we identified here. So, uh, yeah. again, coming from the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, here, um, let's let's split up uh, renewables into two sort of camps, right? So, one is okay. this utility scale renewables camp. Um, you can think of it as you know large scale renewable farms. In in our industry, right. we would typically rate them one megawatt or above. So that's the utility scale world. And um, you know all this is happening with renewables, but I think it's a, a parallel market that that is also very becoming very appealing is the real estate market, right? Uh, because right. you need to have land to you know to, to do these things um, or ocean acreage uh, for, if, if you're out in the ocean. Sure. Um, now, so that's that's one side of the camp. The other the other side is this uh, small scale or distributed uh, type. Uh, renewable technologies mostly that's okay people think of it as uh, as, as solar pv or battery energy storage and things as such um so if if we look at the first side of the house first uh which is this utility scale one uh, you know they're they're the usual suspects right so california is um yeah. up on top 
uh, yep. surprisingly for several. Nor- that one I would have expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so the rest so, of it, not so much. So, so surprisingly for for the others, right? Like you said, North Carolina is number two, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't expect that one at all. And frankly, um, you know, I live in Arizona and I see a lot of sun. In fact, it's shining like pretty brightly right now. Uh, yeah. You know, you would have you, you would think that, you know, places like Nevada, Arizona, you know, they, they would also be in at least in the top uh, top, uh, you know, these top three. Um, yes, but but yes. the closest one uh, in the top three, or the, at the third number, was Texas, right? So yes. we're gonna we're gonna hold on to Texas because that's uh, that's gonna be a really interesting discussion. We're gonna on, come back to we're, Texas. We're, yes. we're, we're gonna, got a bit more to say on that one. We're, we're gonna come back to that one. But if we move on to the the, the small scale side, right? Again, the usual yeah. suspects. Um, you know, California is again number one, um, and and I think pretty much everybody can identify. W- yeah. with that uh why, why it's there in now in this case um the 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 next three were uh new jersey massachusetts and new york right and who would yeah. have, you know what's, what the heck is going on over there right so <laughs> what's going on there so why are states in the northeast suddenly driving hard on photovoltaic solar panel uptake Right, that seems like the wrong part of the of the states to me. <laughs> you would think that Arizona again yeah. would be on that list, right? Again, it's not on the on on the top three, or in this case, the top five. Um, yeah. So it it really begs the question, you know, why uh, why are those states, which you know traditionally may not be thought of as being places that are you know good for um, you know these types of things with with solar uh, yeah. penetration and stuff. Now, one major factor is in this case is you know the, the 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 state governments here have had some really really aggressive policies, like we discussed in New York, uh, that have uh, you know advanced the cause of getting more and more of these renewables on the grid. So they've set some aggressive mandates around um, you know uh, decarbonization and achieving uh, a, a right. proportion of electricity through renewables, and that is you know feeding into these results that we're seeing on the ground. Um, interestingly also, I, I fundamentally believe too, is that this is being driven a lot also by what I said in the, the, the first episode is the cost equation, right? So that these costs are, are becoming very competitive. It's becoming more and more affordable as time goes on. So, you know, we're, we're sort of getting into this era now let's, uh, Simon, if I may, let's, let's switch back to Texas, right? Uh, yes. uh, So, um, Texas was not one of the ones I expected. And um, I mean, just to be a little bit foolish for a moment, I mean, I'm a, I'm a child who grew up in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I remember Dallas and Dynasty, the shoulder pads, the oil barons ball. I remember J.R. Ewing and all this good stuff. Uh, this is a, a, a state that is known the world over as being absolutely, absolutely to the core, a fossil fuel state. It's oil, mostly, and gas, some. So how on earth has Texas become this hotspot for renewable energy? Yeah, so, um, you know, absolutely right. You know, Houston or, or Texas in general is the oil sort of capital of the world and has been for many, many years. Um, yes. And that's not really the place, again, you think of, you know, renewables, right? You'd think like no. you know, it's the sort of the oil and gas um, capital, like I said. Now, one observation that we made was uh, some numbers that are coming out of ERCOT. So ERCOT is sort of this um, uh, arm in the state that looks at you know what the what the interconnection queues are like, and interconnection queues consisting of generation projects that you know people are trying to connect to Texas's grid. Right um, now, that queue is 121 gigawatts. Right, so that's a that's a pretty large queue, and I think these numbers that's are a lot of power. Exactly. Yes. So these numbers are couple weeks old, uh, maybe maybe a month old. Um, right. And out of that 121 gigawatts, right, only about six gigawatts is um, conventional, uh, you know, fossil fuel type sources. So natural gas was, wow. I think, 5.4 gigawatts and um, coal was at 400 megawatts. I mean, that is really, really small um, in, in terms of the big picture of, you know, this 100 and, uh, 121 gigawatts, the rest is renewables. <laughs> it's all renewables. So wow. 
uh, again, Gosh. you know, and, and this is an environment where there aren't, you know, substantial policies promoting, uh, you know, the adoption of such technologies. Uh, so, you know, in, in that type of an environment, still, even it's, yeah. you know, it's still, it's still happening. And um, still happening. Yeah. I, again, wow. the, the, you know, the, I think the investment community is seeing the, you know, the, the financial returns here and, you know, it's, it's something they, they can truly see that their risk is going to get rewarded. Uh, so there's, there's a lot yeah. of momentum coming from, from those areas. So, I mean, we talked about BlackRock and, and the European, um, investment yeah. firm yeah, yeah, yeah. earlier. Um, and likewise, it's the same, you know, it's the same in the, in the state of Texas. Add to that, the fact too, that, you know, these, these costs have come down tremendously. Um, so I think it's, it's, these it's, are the drivers then, yeah. The, these are the drivers and, you know, we're, this, this is really the future when it comes to, you know, uh, renewables. I mean, if a state like this without, you know, any substantial yeah. policy, you know, we're talking about unsubsidized costs being, you know, cost competitive to conventional fuel sources, you know, it's, it's, it's creating an environment now, uh, if Texas can do it, then actually the, 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 every state, well, every country and every state can, essentially. can really take the journey. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, just a couple of uh, a couple of things we just want to touch on before 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 we close out. One of the things, Sal, that I wanted to reference, um, I guess we we've made it sound very rosy and very, you know, we had our rose tinted spectacles on here, haven't we? And we've made it sound like renewals are, uh, renewables are going to be some sort of unstoppable force. A big silver bullet going to solve everything for us. And and yet, um, the situation in California seems to be worthy of discussion. It's topical. Um, but it also has a, it plays into, you know, some of the things we've been talking about here. So we have a, um, well, it, renewables can't solve this conundrum, the one that's going on in California. Perhaps you could just explain for us, you know, what, what the issues in California are and, and how renewables have perhaps been part of the problem and may not be entirely part of the solution. Right. So before I do that, I think I'm going to ask the audience to grab a cup of tea. Um, I, Simon, one for one, actually invested at some nice tea from, apparently it's from London. I don't know if anybody can Bless see you, it here. Sir. It smells well, we're really glad amazing that you did. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really good. So I just wanted to throw the plug in for this, uh, some nice British tea. Uh, so we're, I have my cup of tea to hand. <laughs> That's like we're, do. we're on that too. So now back to uh, back to California. Um, what's what's you know a couple, couple of weeks ago in, in California we had the situation with rolling blackouts and at the heart of it oh. you know without getting into too much detail it's uh, you get into these situations where you have to actually intentionally cause blackouts or cut power to customers because you don't have enough capacity in your system to provide you know, the electricity to, to, uh, to, your, to your electricity consumers. Um, California, like we noticed with those previous, um, you know, discussions on, you know, it's, it's on the top, both on um, uh, the utility scale as well as small scale when it comes to solar. And it's also very strong in renewables overall. Um, so what's happened is that, you know, let's look at solar as, as we discussed this also in the previous episode, that uh, yeah. we have this thing called the duck curve, right? Um, yeah, and and the the challenge is that as this duck curve gets steeper and steeper, you know, and when when the sun sort of goes away, you know, you have to still provide all of that electricity that was previously being covered by solar. So yeah. uh, a couple of weeks ago, or almost a month ago too, now in in California, the temperatures, you know, they were like uh, breaking records. They were, high, they were they, they were ex it was extremely extremely hot. So as you know. People then tune into their air conditioners, and they're probably running them even at you know cooler temperatures, uh, and and all that is electrical yeah. load that keeps getting added onto the grid. Um, and in this case, one it was the temperatures, but then there was also these unplanned um, you know outages of you know of of some generation in, in California's yes. grid. Um, yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, this exceeding demand, this unplanned outage of of a conventional generation source. Uh, that sort of fed into the perfect storm where um, in 2020, uh, you know, the California ISO had to issue a stage three, um, you know, emergency uh, declaration that, you know, we, we are actually going to have to get into, you know, this, this, this situation and we're going to, you know, rolling blackouts will rolling potentially, blackouts. potentially occur. And wow. they, they ended up occurring. And interestingly enough that, you know, between 6 and 8 p.m. in California, uh, they had, I think, 400 thousand plus customers without power for the same reason because there wasn't enough capacity on the grid to meet that demand again solar sort of going away at that wow. time frame in the middle of a heat wave 
in the middle yeah, of a heat wave, in the, in the middle of you know this uh, unplanned outage of a, a particular generation source. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it and just, the forest fires too. Oh, and, uh, and, and sound, then you know the yeah, you know. So if you if you add on to the forest fires equation now, right? So uh, I, I think personally, this is an amazing opportunity to understand the application of analytics as compared to uh, pollutants in the air or you know molecules right. that that can impact the solar uh, PV generation. And um, so what we're noticing with the with the wildfires now is that there's a lot of smoke. In fact, I just saw um, uh, this morning that the smoke has actually now reached the shores of North uh, New York. <laughs> I mean, wow. because we have this jet stream that runs across the U.S. Well, that's right. And it's burning right up the coast, not just California, but into Oregon and, and beyond. So exactly. It's, 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 exactly. It's horrendous. So again, the smoke, you know, uh, if you looked at some of the pictures from San Francisco earlier, um, yeah, uh, or, I've seen some of those on earlier this yeah. week. I mean, it's it's orange skies, right? So it'd be interesting, uh, one, you know, to to analyze what the impact of this power production from solar is going to be. But again, it speaks volumes. You know, uh, the climate change is real, and you know, we're seeing more and more of these events occurring. Um, yes, and you know, we're, we're going to have to um, uh, we're going to have to truly understand one from just you know the integration perspective of renewables, right? Um, how yes. how do we sort of manage these variable sources more effectively so we don't run into these situations like rolling blackouts? I'm going to save the well. You know, that's right. I'm going to save it for suspense on how we're going to do that. But one of the things that I can share is that a key enablement engine here is the application of analytics from forecasting um, wind and solar generation to forecasting weather to better yes. understanding you know yeah, the, the, the load consumption patterns. Um, all the way to better, you know, having the ability to, to optimize this different uh, these these different sources of energy. So I, I see absolutely a, a field right. Yeah, we've used the phrase optimization before, haven't we, to describe mm -hmm. some of some of these challenges? I mean, they're very weighty challenges, but it, it sounds eminently solvable if you if you connect all these these machines up. If each each of these yeah, yeah. power generating units is is a machine, effectively. I mean, it, I suppose the conclusion that the novice in me would reach is that you know a grid that's dominated by renewables actually is is a, is a lopsided grid that actually may not serve you well after the hours of darkness and when the wind stops blowing. Yeah, well... You need something else yeah. in the mix. And yeah. so that then has to be a, a judgment about how it's mixed and exactly. when and all this. And it's, that's the that's the part for analytics um, that, that we Indeed. feel has a very, very strong uh, impact on, on making yeah. that renewable future a true reality or getting decarbonization yeah. to where it needs to be. Um, so yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That, that is the case. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm very conscious of the time and I'm very conscious that we've, we've covered a lot of ground and, and we've had a lot of statistics and a lot of sort of uh, not heavy content, but we certainly we've touched on an awful lot of material there. So um, we'll have to wrap things up for today, Sal. So um, t for the audience, join us again soon for another episode in our series. And the next episode we're calling Energy Independence Anthem and uh, where we're going to explore the ch changing business models for the industry and what energy independence truly means. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us today. As ever, please come back and see us again soon. Uh, until the next time, it's goodbye from me, Simon Hughes in the UK, and also from my good friend, Sal Gill in Arizona. Thank you, Simon, and thank everybody for listening. Bye-bye, and be safe. Cheers, Sal. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.